Recently, I've been exploring later Spectrum titles that I missed at the time because in all honesty, I had moved on. And it got me wondering, were the last games that publishers were chucking out better than the first ones? Were the early games that magazines reviewed still as good as the final ones just before they closed their doors? So today, I wanna play a game where we look at a bunch of my favorite publishers and magazines and see who comes out on top. The very first game they either reviewed or published versus the very last game. What do you reckon? Kind of like uh, 80s versus the 90s, 16K versus 128K, putting out any old shit versus porting games you really shouldn't have. So let's open this can of worms by starting off with possibly the granddaddy of them all, Ocean Software. Originally called the ridiculously shit name of Spectrum Games, John Woods and David Ward quickly realised that pushing a Commodore 64 title by somebody called Spectrum Games was a little confusing to say the least. So a rename was on the cards and Ocean Software was born. Like most software publishers at the time, unlicensed arcade game ripoffs were very much the order of the day in the early 80s and Ocean Software were no different. Two games seemed to be pushed out at the same time and advertised a little bit before others as seen here on the front of the mid-August 1983 edition of Home Computer Weekly, right next to the arse of this ZX81 owner. The two games were Kong, which is a pretty obvious ripoff of Donkey Kong, and Armageddon, which was a Missile Command clone. So with releasing two games pretty much at the same time, I've got to choose one. So I've gone for Kong mainly because it's one of those games that seemed like a rite of passage for Spectrum owners back in the day. Everybody had a copy and everybody agreed it sucked. In the Oracle video I did a little while ago, links uh, up here and, and down there, me and my mate gave it a three out of 10 back in the mid to late eighties. So I definitely didn't think highly of it, but playing it now gives me a big nostalgia hit. The sound Kong makes when he stomps with his disappearing legs to make the platforms wonky, the constant annoying buzz as you play, the weedy looking main character which is about as far removed from Mario as humanly possible, the ridiculous speed of the barrels and Mario at the start of the game that gets slower as you make your way up. I always assumed he got tired at that point. The stupid jump mechanic which is an impossibility to get right every time, the color clash which informs you which ladders to avoid, the fact it had a trainer mode where you could practice any of the levels to your heart's content and the stupid times you get stuck trying to climb a ladder because it thinks you are not lined up properly. All these points and more make me love and hate this game a little bit at the same time. Ironically, Ocean managed to get the proper license for Donkey Kong by the time they made a sequel and actually pushed out another original game by 1986. But that is only remembered for Mario's arse cheeks. Kong is the one etched in everyone's soul. So what's it up against? Well, like their first games, Ocean did the same with their last by publishing a couple of games pretty much at the same time. In this case, Adam's Family and Robocop 3 were both pushed out at around April 1992. But looking at all the dates for advertisements and reviews, Adam's Family looks to be the last. So it's the one to go against Kong here. My only experience of this game is Rose Tinted Spectrum's Halloween special on the YouTubes. I say only experience because after watching him suffer for his art, I vowed never to play the sodding thing. It appears to be as hard as convincing my four-year-old daughter to eat anything other than pasta and rice. But was he just humming it up for views? Well, that's that's it really, isn't it? Which, left or right, which way shall I die? Make your guesses now. One life left, okay. How pleasantly kind of you. I bet I've got to go back the other way again. It loves making you walk backwards. Oh, f In short, no. No, he wasn't. On the surface, this is just another platformer where you must collect stuff, rescue members of the family, yada, yada, yada. But none of that is relevant because the movement is f***ing ridiculous. It sounds great and the intro is fantastic, jaunty and creepy at the same time, catching the real essence of Adam's family. But that's where my enjoyment ended. I tried to follow the basic start to the walkthrough video and was pulling out chunks of hair pretty early on. The colour clash avoidance doesn't help, with the protagonist almost invisible at times, let alone some of the moving objects you are supposed to jump on. The biggest problem is adding this all up and then applying the stupid inertial movement to the mix. In the walkthrough video, someone has even commented that the game is so much better once you disable this shitty movement with a poke. 
It's a shame because there is a humongous game underneath. Look how far you have to zoom out to see the whole map. The game is mahoosive, but even with infinite lives, I probably would never see it. So who wins shit first game versus shit last game then? I'm gonna give it to last games on this one. If Kong was a more playable rendition of the classic arcade game, it might have been given a shout, but stupidly hard game mechanics aside, Adam's family looks pretty awesome and sounds great too. Two things Kong also failed to do, so there. One nil to the lasts. Chris and Tim Stamper saw an opportunity away from their arcade machine roots and decided to use their experience and knowledge to tap in on the home computer market with the company name Ultimate Play The Game. Unmistakable box art, which always seemed to give off high quality vibes, was more often than not matched by the games within. Their first game, and the one we're looking at here, is the undoubted 16K King, Jetpack. Like Kong mentioned earlier, everybody had a copy of this game. And in the early days of the humble Specky, everyone loved it. The arcade experience the Stampers were looking to replicate did not disappoint. The gameplay is still incredibly smooth playing today with a nice mix of colours on a black background. Although the level design remains the same, a mix of different baddies to contend with make the gameplay varied as you try to build or refuel your rocket ship. The simplicity of the gameplay meant that as games became more complex and involved, it was very much left alone. I certainly wouldn't have touched this game past 1985, but when looking back at the Spectrum games as a middle-aged adult, it's one of those games that you instantly want to return to. It sold 300,000 copies on release and possibly takes the title as the best 16K game, if not top three at least, a true classic. By the time their last game came to market, Ultimate were a different beast altogether. By 1985, Ultimate had sold the stake of the company to US Gold, who continued to release games under the Ultimate label. The games were sadly not up to much, sales faltered, and the Ultimate label just fizzled out. Future purchases and promises of a return of the label never materialized, so the last game published under the Ultimate label for the ZX Spectrum was the 1987 isometric nonsense called Bubbler. I say nonsense because just listen to this premise I'm gonna zip through just to make it more confusing. After 100 years or more, you discover that Vardor's assistant, a lesser wizard called Kintor, who had helped Vardor to overthrow Urkron, has now been imprisoned. Kintor's power is increasing and would soon be equal to that of Vardra, and Vardra feared this as Kintor was becoming sympathetic to the plight of the Urkron people. Before his powers became too great, Vardra encapsulated Kintor into a sphere of energy, which slowly drained his life force and then condemned him to the dungeon. Blah blah blah, Kintor told of magic corks that he had created and hidden in the city of Urkon which would stop the bubblers and diminish the power of Vardra. As Vardra's power is gradually diminished, Kintor's powers is thus rejuvenated, giving you extra time to complete your mighty task. Yep. It's utterly bonkers, which I'm all for quite honestly, but the game behind it has to stand up too. Sadly, this doesn't. Firstly, the controls. You have to rely on the compass thing to determine which way you are facing all the while making sure none of the bad is run into you or shoot you. Everything is gloriously yellow, making seeing things a little harder, and it's all too easy to slip off the edge into the abyss. On the walkthrough, someone commented that they bought this in the bargain bucket for a quid in the late 80s, played it, hated it, but sold it for 60 quid years on. Honestly, making that much money on the game is definitely the only plus I can see. The magazines at the time quite liked it, with Sinclair users Graham Taylor, no, not that joke again, giving it five stars, even though he admitted to it being fiendishly difficult. No shit, Graham. So it's an easy claw back for the first game crew and a win for Jetpack, 1-1. Now, as I recently mentioned them in the minority stake terms of fingers in the ultimate pie, US Gold are most definitely up next. Certainly not the most inventive publishing house to ever exist, but they did bring a lot of great games and licenses to our rubber keyed friend. So I figured, why the hell not? Founded by Anne and Jeff Brown, seen here with John Woods and David Ward of Ocean, this Birmingham based publisher saw a gap publishing games from America to the European market and very successful they were at it too, before selling up to Eidos in 1996 for a cool 17 odd million. So what Spectrum game did they put out first on their road to their millions? Well, it's another one I have very fond memories of, both on the Spectrum and the Commodore 64. Their 1984 port of the Atari 8-bit game, Beachhead. Coming out just before Blue Max and Bruce Lee, Beachhead was a big hit for US Gold. A fairly simple and short game when viewed now with a series of mini games that culminate in blowing up the gun tower at the end. With varied gameplay that always felt like enough of a challenge when younger, it was certainly a game you had one more go at trying to defeat the end gun. The way it slowly turned at you whilst you desperately tried to get your angles right was pretty terrifying. 
The game was also fairly generous in the amount of lives it gave you and the ability to skip the mines but have more of a challenge against the planes and ships. Getting past the ships is still pretty tough but so damn playable trying to get the angles just right with the overly sensitive up and down controls. Although Beachhead was fairly unique, it certainly didn't push the boundaries. US Gold's last game certainly did that. Released again very close to other games, in this instance G-Lock and Bonanza Brothers, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis was probably their last Spectrum game and probably their most ambitious. Very much a 16-bit game squeezed via multi-load which made emulation pretty tough going, this game honestly shouldn't exist. This is the action game version though and not the point and click adventure that I certainly remember more. Watching how this plays on something like the Atari ST makes you realise what you're up against on the ageing spectrum. With lots of controls and slow sluggish movement it's a pretty tough play in 2024. Back in the day I might have persevered. It looks pretty good albeit in one colour but it was hard to control on keyboard with rotation keys for the character and the camera. Listen to the soundtrack though just for one minute. Worth the entry fee alone, but for me, the first game's nick this one. Beachhead isn't trying too hard and is playing within its limits, which make it ultimately very playable. The same can't be said for Indy. Sorry mate, 2-1 to the firsts. Budget time now, and I went with the most consistent budget publishing house I could think of. This was another software business set up by brothers, this time Richard and David Darling. Having had a great deal of success writing games for Mastertronic, to the point they owned a big stake in the company, by October 1996 they decided to go it alone and set up their own budget label called Codemasters. In November or December that same year they published their first Spectrum game. Interestingly, the first being a follow up to the Mastertronic game, Non Terra Aquus, I'm, if that's how you say it. The first Spectrum game they released was called the much easier to say Terra Cognita. A fairly zippy shoot 'em up where certain tiles you fly over give you different weapons, energy, fuel, etc. It does move at a fair old pace with no problems of any slowdown, but my 50 year old eyes couldn't take more than a few minutes at a time staring at the bright backdrop trying to decipher if I'm going to collect something or smash into a wall. It soon felt like one of those reader's games that appeared on so many cover tapes later on in the decade, and it certainly oozed budgetness. But did this budgetness, new word, carry on through with Codemasters to the end of their publishing days? Well, to find out we have to choose between two games which are seemingly released together around February, March 1993. Wrestling Superstars was one of them, which was a fairly average, yes you've guessed it, wrestling game, and the other is the one we're going to look at, the utterly confusing Robin Hood Legend Quest. Why confusing you ask? Just another budget platformer by the lovely Oliver Twins, no? Well, yes it is, but a few years prior they released a Super Robin Hood, which was a very successful game for Codemasters and a launch pad for the Oliver Twins to go to do bigger and better things. Sometimes later, looking for a game to do on the NES, the Twins decided to port Super Robin Hood to it. Sometime after that, they decided to port the NES version of Super Robin Hood back to the Spectrum. Okay, the game had a very different look and feel about it, but it made researching the blimmin' thing pretty complicated to say the least. But is it any good? Well, yeah, it's not bad actually. Blimmin' tough, collect keys, dodge arrows, open doors and die a lot, but for a budget release it was a fair representation of the NES port, of the Spectrum port, back to the Spectrum port. Not much more to say about it unless I spent some serious time with it. I played it for about half an hour, I died multiple times, but I enjoyed it to a certain extent nonetheless. So better than Terra Cognita? Hell yeah. It doesn't give me a splitting headache for one, which is always a plus. It did cost more though, with early Codemaster games being two quid, which is roughly five and a half quid now, to Robin Hood being four quid in 1993, which would be a whopping eight quid in today's money. But anyways, the last games bring it back this time, 2-2. When anyone talks about Sheffield's finest video game publishers, Gremlin Graphics, they often cite Percy the Potty Pigeon as the first game, and I believe it was their first game full stop, but was it the first Spectrum one? 
Now, it's hard to tell when researching it, but I think it was a very close second to the game or series of games everyone knows Gremlin Graphics for, and the one we are going for here, Wanted Monty Mole. Released in July 1984 and even featured on the news for its references to the minor strikes that were big stories at the time, the game was a huge success for Gremlin. Namely because it was very much in the same vein as other popular platforms at the time, Manic Miner and Jet Set Willy. Monty Mole always sat a little differently though with me. This game always felt like a budget offering before budget games really existed. Although there are pixel perfect jumps in the game, there's always a feeling that the jumps or the ropes or the platforms or whatever just didn't line up right. It wasn't as clean as the Matthew Smith games if that makes sense. To see what I mean, just try and climb the house on the opening screen. If you manage it, it will often bug the game so bad you couldn't play it. Not many games can be broken so badly early on. Also sometimes things kill you and other times you collect them. It's never obvious what kills you and what doesn't. Well, not to me anyway, then or now. Still, grumbles aside, I do have a soft spot for it. It certainly entertained me enough back then to explore many Monty Mole titles. And honestly, I rather enjoyed playing it again for this video, despite all the things I don't like about it. And the last game, another ridiculously ambitious title that begs the question, why? Nigel Mansell's World Championship is viewed on the Amiga, looks like a racing game should in 1993. Stick it on the pretty much dead spectrum and you have a tape loading nightmare, unless you had a plus three of course. Even disc owners would have to put up with the one color low frame rate nastiness that really doesn't play well at all today. I feel for the magazines at the time as there were slim pickings indeed, so anything remotely ambitious like this would have been difficult to slate. Sure it has all the options and all the tracks, but that's all it has. In between loading from the cassette is another headache inducing color scheme that really doesn't work. I'd love to know what the deal was in getting this to the Spectrum in the first place. It should have been left well alone. Monty might have had his bugs and issues, but playability always wins the day. 3-2 to the first games. Another Liverpudlian publisher up next that is synonymous with the ZX Spectrum, albeit rather short-lived unfortunately as they went bankrupt in 1985. Bug Bite are an important addition to this list though for a number of reasons. Firstly, they published THE classic Spectrum game, the one everyone mentions when asked to name a game they remember playing all those decades ago, Manic Miner. They also had so many people working for them that went off to make publishing houses of their own, from Software Projects, DKtronics and Imagine Software. They also had the first number one game for the Spectrum listed in the PCW magazine chart in December 1982, which is the game first up here, Spectral Invaders. Not a whole lot to say about this Space Invaders clone other than it set a precedent of Spectrum games being hard as nails. This one takes no prisoners. It moves at a right old pace, especially the speed of the raining alien shots that sometimes leave you thinking you've dodged them before delayed death screen hits you. The disintegration of your home bases is nicely done and the variation of alien waves is too. By the time the last game came along in 1989, Bug Bite had been passed around somewhat. The brand was acquired by Argus, not Argos, in 1985 who continued to use the name for budget titles. Then Argus was bought out and rebadged to Grand Slam Entertainment, which is ultimately responsible for the final game, Wild Water. I can see what they were trying to do with this budget release and if the controls were better the game might have been passable. But if you get stuck, no amount of turning or reversing helps you before you ultimately take too much damage and sink. This makes it incredibly frustrating to play for any duration. And for the small flashes where you get it lined up, it can be quite enjoyable, but the enjoyment is often short lived as you get to the next gate at a wonk and start the frustrated process again. Honestly, I thought that most games would be an early Space Invaders clone, but yet again, playability wins the day. The first stretch the lead to 4 2. Commando, Ghost and Goblins, and Paperboy all came from Elite Systems and were almost all certainly some of my favourite games growing up. Released just before the infamous Airwolf game, Kokotoni Wilf takes first spot and it's the sort of game where I wonder how the hell did I miss it. It almost needs a video all by itself as you, Wilf, work through the ages up to the space stations and moon bases of uh, 2001. Quite a nice flying mechanic allows you to swoop around collecting items and easily moving on to the next 60 odd screens. 
I say easily, but sometimes it's an actual bastard, like this one here. Without safe states, I would be so pissed not getting past this. Also, some star things just seem to randomly reappear, and the hitboxes are a law unto themselves. All that aside, it's quite a delightful little game that I'm still ashamed about not even knowing it existed. As for the last game, well, it's a game the Spectrum should have handled well, but sadly just feels like a really lazy port of a Sega football game called World Championship Soccer that would have been far superior at this point everywhere else. Handled by Canvas, that had previous on dubious Spectrum games, this one could have been so much better. The players are hard to track, and the defending by either yourself or the opposition seems non-existent, as even the CPU has no idea what's going on. No redefinable keys means you're stuck with 6, 7, 8 and 0 for shooting, and it's quite frankly criminal by 1991 when this came out. Crash gave it just over the 50% mark, which is possibly too high for me, but I suppose there is a game in there somewhere if you're brave enough to persevere and not check out the more powerful machine versions at the same time. But it's going to be another win for the first though, and by some margin, 5-2. Now, the magazines, and you'd think the research was easier and I wasn't kicking myself at this point for stupid thoughts whilst trying to sleep, but no. First titles, yes. Take first issues and find the first reviews. Fairly easy apart from Sinclair User, but we'll come to that shortly. Last games, not so much. By the end of the Spectrum magazine's days, they had very little new stuff to review, so would churn out re-releases or old titles to fill pages. I was looking for the last officially released game at the time that they were reviewed, and I think I found them. My favourite up first was Crash Magazine, and blimey what a first game to review. A game that often grabs top spots for all the Spectrum games that ever existed, never mind firsts and lasts. Micromegas Death Chase. Hurtling through the forest day or night trying to shoot the other riders or other vehicles for bonus points is kind of all there is to the game, but the speed that is simulated here is still great today. The trees come at you thick and fast as the sectors progress and there is a definite feeling of accomplishment if you manage to avoid a big bunch of them hurtling towards you. Played over eight sectors and just looped around if you manage the dense forest of the later stages, there are some fun facts about Death Chase you may or may not know. Number one. It was released for the Timex TX 2068, which was the third and final release for the Spectrum equivalent in the US market. The slightly altered game, so it would work on the Timex machine and have improved sound, was weirdly renamed to Cycle Path. Number two. The loading screen of the game clearly shows a motorbike, but the cassette cover shows a more futuristic setting with hover bikes on a vector grid. The instructions clearly state a futuristic setting too, the year being 2501 no less. When the game was rebranded under the Zeppelin label, the loading screen was updated to match the original cover's hoverbike theme, but then oddly reverts to a different story about escaped convicts on motorbikes. Even the front cover has a clear laser shooting motorbike on it. All the while these contrasting themes exist, the in-game bike clearly looks like a motorbike. Number 3. At the end of your Sinclair's run, they had their official chart and reader's chart of all-time best specy games. Death Chase took the number one spot for your Sinclair and got number 10 for the readers. When your Sinclair first reviewed the game for its budget re-release in 1986, they were fairly damning about its longevity. Maybe some classics would be best left in human memory rather than revived in the macros. Blimey. So what poor sod is up against this 16k behemoth? This is. Yep, Crash's last proper review was a shit one. Jimmy's Super League is a follow-up to Jimmy's Soccer Manager and is very much in the same vein, it seems, albeit with a nicer graphical office menu and a European Super League. There is so little to it though. My first starting 11 didn't have a goalkeeper, but I only narrowly lost to Bayern Munich. The time between screens make the game feel broken or crashed and the graphical representation is laughable for the time this game was released. Ironically, released by a publishing house called Beyond Belief. They were right. It was. 6-2. Firebird was almost a publisher I was going to feature, so it's nice to get one of their games into this stupidity. The game is the isometric nonsense Rasputin. This was all rather coincidentally the first game Your Sinclair reviewed in 1986, the first game to receive the Your Sinclair Mega Game, and was also given away on the first issue cover tape as a demo. 
Rasputin is yet another isometric game that I could take or leave back then and have very little time for now. Although I do appreciate the genre, I just don't enjoy it. The controls are quite fiddly, I often press jump rather than walk forward, which ultimately leads to my premature death. Graphically, it's lovely, albeit in one colour, but that's often a given on specy titles. The 128K soundtrack is pretty cool actually, with a rather nice digitised speech in between restarting levels. I am Rasputin. <laughs> this has to be one of the nicest main character sprites I've ever seen too, with a lot of detail given on our chap's armour and shield. I did manage to get across a few screens once I'd figured out the exits and entrances, but it didn't offer me much enjoyment, although that is a me problem really. As for your Sinclair's last game, well it couldn't be more last if it tried. Alternative Software's 1993 release Dalek Attack is often regarded as the last commercially available Spectrum game ever produced. It's easy to see why when you see that in the only magazine still standing at this point, your Sinclair only really had this game to review and then just re-releases or back catalogue page fillers. And it's a shame that like others before it, the last game here means the reviews go out on a whimper. Dalek Attack only got 56%, which I think might have been a little bit harsh. I read the entirety of the review and after playing the game for an hour or so, I agree with pretty much everything they said. It's really just another platformer with a Doctor Who theme, which doesn't really fit. I don't remember Doctor Who running around like a madman, shooting at everything with his sonic whatever it was, but that's pretty much what you do here. The controls are a bit janky, and the one-tone graphics make some of the jumps or places to go really hard to see. It's nigh on impossible to avoid incoming missiles or lasers, etc. And it quickly becomes an exercise in just running and jumping at a million miles an hour in the hope you might avoid some of the bullets raining in on you. Graphically, although hard to see at times, it's done very well. The animations as you grab onto the ledges or hold onto your hat on jumps is very nicely done. The sound is okay, nothing special, but the best thing about the game is its speed. It really zips along for a specky game. It's actually really impressive how it scrolls, and I think that alone gives it the edge over Rasputin. The last game's claw one back to 6-3. And so finally we have Sinclair User, which was always a distant third behind Crash and Your Sinclair for me, and also a pain to track down the first proper review for. They reviewed ZX81 and Spectrum games pretty early on, but the reviews only really told you the premise of the game and available places you could buy it. It wasn't until April 1984 in issue 25 that they finally started scoring games out of 10, giving games a Gilbert rating named after John Gilbert, the software editor at the time. The very first game to receive a Gilbert rating of 6 was a Tempest clone by PSS called The Guardian. It's not a bad clone actually, it's very quick, a little too quick at times, but it's a Tempest clone with a rubbish meteor level where you can pretty much sit in one corner and avoid all the incomings. It has some nice features though, like the effect the smart bomb has when it wipes all the baddies in a nice rainbow swoop. The game has a very early entry feel about it, but it's not too shabby and does what it says on the tin. Talking of tins, the very last game does not do as it says. Bullish Sports Darts is a darts game, yes, but that is the only resemblance to the popular TV show that it pulls its name from. A series of different sports are played using uh, darts, but also classic 501 games are available if you wish. It looks okay I guess and the variations are interesting, but 180 it isn't. The hand moves all over the place making any sort of precise shot near impossible. It barely feels like you are controlling it at all which is a shame because it could have been a pretty decent little darts game to sign off with. With all that in mind I'm going to give it to The Guardian. Yes, it's an arcade clone, but how many dart games were there also? It's not the best game in the world, but it's more fun than trying to throw darts whilst you're dancing. And just before we leave Sinclair User, I did like this farewell photo at the end of the issue, with one of the chaps wearing a Nintendo t-shirt, maybe as a nod to what was next for Spectrum Gamers. So we finish, with seven wins to three for the first games, that just goes to show, yep, there was shit early on, but there was even more shit at the end. It became more obvious as I played through these games that by the time these last games came out, the Spectrum was an afterthought or just a downright stupid idea to port any games to. Nobody was writing games just for the spec anymore, which meant games were suffering. At least in the beginning, there were plenty of publishers eager to get their big games out. Everything weird, wacky and in between was tried. Some failed miserably and a lot became classics that still hold up today. If you look at 16K games that are still so much fun now, like Jetpack, Death Chase, The Horace Games, Harrier Attack, and how ultimately the same breadth of games didn't blow us away as much when the 128K came out, 
I mean, sure, we had where time stood still or carrier command, but often 1 to 8K games were just upgraded 48K ones with better sound and less multi loading. By the early 90s, most publishers had moved on and the Spectrum was very much last on the list in terms of ports. It's kind of sad how it all fizzled out, but perhaps it was for the best. I'm sure any new iterations of the Spectrum that could still play the older games wouldn't have stood up against the fierce competition then. So, as the early games win, I'd love to know what your early game favourites were. What games did you get when you opened up your Spectrum on Christmas morning or on your birthday or whenever you got it? Please let me know in the comments. And I think I'm going to do a special 16K special celebration video to honour these early games and uh, pick some of my favourite really, really early 16K ones out. Anyway, until then, bye for now and I'll see you on the next one. I am Rasputin. <laughs>